Good afternoon and welcome to Talk's latest webinar, Humanizing the Reservation Experience. We are excited to have you join us. My name is Melissa Maciejewski and I'm part of Talk's account management team. Been with Talk for the past four years now, but prior to that, I had over a decade of experience working front of house and managing reservation in both casual and Michelin starred restaurants. For those joining us, us that aren't familiar with the Talk platform, Talk was built by restaurants for restaurants, offering the perfect blend of technology and hospitality. Whether you're filling last minute seats for Friday night's dinner service, debuting a new cocktail class series, or promoting a one night only collaboration event, Talk makes booking easy and ensures that service runs smoothly. Think of Talk as an all in one platform that showcases whatever your business does best. In today's webinar, we'll discuss how technology has affected the hospitality industry. Internet can certainly make running a restaurant easier, but it also puts a barrier between you and your guests. It can make things like no-shows, last-minute cancellations, and online reviews feel very personal. So how can your restaurant bring a little more humanity back into its interactions with guests? Today, you'll learn tools and techniques to make guest communication feel a little more authentic, how to craft personalized experiences to keep guests engaged mm. and excited about what you're doing. And we'll share some tips for cultivating loyalty with your regulars so they come back to dine with you again and again. Before we get started with introductions, I do want to call attention to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Mm -hmm. Throughout the webinar, feel free to add any questions you have, and I'll be sure, sure, to, share, uh, sure to save some time to address them at the end. Now, very pleased to introduce today's panelists. Uh, we have Lacey Irby joining us uh, as the owner at Dear Margaret, and Joe Frillman, the executive chef and proprietor at Daisy's. So thank you so much, Lacey and Joy, for joining us today. Uh, we typically try not to play favorites here at Talk, uh, but we're very excited to have two local Chicago businesses. Uh, you definitely have some fans here in the Chicago office, and I can personally attest to having really lovely dining experiences at both your restaurants. Uh, but for our non-Chicagoans out there, can you maybe share a little bit uh, about your different concepts? And Joe, we'll start with you and Daisy's. Hi, uh, yeah, my name is Joe Frillman. Um, I own Daisy's Restaurant in the Logan Square neighborhood of Chicago. We opened, uh, well, three months ago, but six years ago, we just moved uh, to a bigger location. It is a pasta-focused, um, vegetable-inspired uh, Midwest Italian restaurant, um, whatever that may be, but it's basically what we say. Um, if the Midwest was a region in Italy, what would the food kind of look like? And so um, my brother has a farm in Michigan, and we use that as kind of the inspiration to drive the menu. Um, so it's a very seasonal uh, restaurant uh, menu, uh, beverage included. So um, yeah, six years, um, and we've been using TOC for, I think, four of that at least. Excellent. And I know Dear Margaret takes some inspiration from the Midwest as well. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. I'm Lacey Irby. I opened Dear Margaret with Chef Ryan Brasso in January 2021. You know, a great time to open a restaurant, especially a Chicago winter and a pandemic. Uh, but we were really excited to bring kind of a different uh, lens of Midwestern ingredients with some French Canadian inspiration as Ryan grew up in Southwestern Ontario. Uh, so we started with talk from the very beginning. Um, we were doing only takeout when we first opened. So all the menus were, sorry about the noise in the background. We are working in the kitchen today as well. Uh, but yeah, so we, uh, we started with our menu on talk. Uh, for to go and then eventually we transitioned to open our dining room about six months later and uh, then started making use of talk for reservation purposes. Excellent. Uh, so as I have been to both of your restaurants, I wanted to call out that I think they both feel particularly warm and inviting. And of course, you know, that comes from great service, but also a lot of the attention to detail that you've put into the space, either, you know, music and lighting, the serviceware that you use, um, typeface on your menus. 
So since we're talking about reservations today, I wanted to see how do you incorporate that attention to detail into the reservation process before guests have a chance to see, you know, what your restaurant is all about? Uh, in terms of, uh, for, for us, um, you know, we try to put ourselves in the seat of the guests. We try to think of a lot of things that we do from uh, a guest's perspective. Um, so, you know, we, a lot of, that doesn't mean that we don't think about what's best for the business either, um, which is part of the reason that we use the platform that we, we do. Um, but it is a big part of it goes through, um, that lens of kind of being a guest ease of use, how they're making those reservations. A lot of times they're through the mobile app, um, or through your website. Um, and it's verbiage, like you said, uh, but also setting the expectation. We try to go above and beyond to make sure that they know what they're getting themselves into, um, when they come into the restaurant. We do things uh, a little bit differently than a lot of restaurants. We, we offer a service charge. Um, we take deposits, um, all in an effort to kind of help us uh, manage um, our inventory of, of seats. But also, you know, when we first had, um, when we first opened in the new space, which is much larger, uh, we went from basically a 66 seat restaurant to 130 seat restaurant. Um, and when we did so, we, we got a lot of attention um, towards the restaurant and we had a lot of attention towards the service charge that we do apply to the bill. Um, we've been doing a service charge for the past three years and what happened was um, they, it goes back to like setting the expectation of what they can expect when they come in. We now use that system to be very upfront about everything that we do. The deposit is applied to your check. The service charge will be applied to your bill. We make them kind of um, make sure that they are aware of it so that we kept getting the feedback that people were surprised um, by some of these fees, et cetera, when they were in the restaurant. So we, we try to do everything we can to set that expectation up front. Um, and we look at that through the lens of a guest first and foremost. Yeah. And I think that is so important. Um, some other businesses that I work with have talked about how, you know, when the guest first steps into your space, that's such an important moment to create, you know, a strong impression and really welcome them into your business. And so if there are any surprises at that moment, it can be really tough to recover from that. But if you can, if you confront it through communication, it's, it's, uh, you know, much easier. Yeah. I would say for us, you know, since we opened without indoor dining, we had the task ahead of us of building a following on really food alone <laughs> um, and making sure the experience was just as great as if you take this dish and it comes home and you put it on a plate at your house that it would be exactly as we would intend it as close as possible uh, if you were to be dining in the restaurant. So we did some little things in the beginning uh, when we were takeout only, um, I look back on it now and I think, oh my gosh, we, we learned a lot along the way, but like we were taking fresh herbs, which are just such a big component of, I, I know lots of restaurants, but especially like that was a big part of what we were doing. A lot of fresh vegetables, fresh herbs. So we were <laughs> taking the herbs and putting them in tiny little two ounce containers so that guests could plate their own uh, once they got home. And hopefully, you know, they wouldn't have a bunch of like wilted greens on top then. Um, and it was just like kind of little attention to detail like that in the beginning, along with a lot of focus on uh, building a presence through uh, social media, primarily Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, when we first opened, we had no dining room furniture. Uh, so people were coming in to pick up their food and it was a completely empty dining room. So we just encouraged people to use their imagination. We'd set up a table anyway, just to sort of like paint the picture of this is what's to come. It's going to be homey. It's going to be comforting, like going to grandma's house we are in fact named for chef's grandmother. Um, so we started to cultivate that even before the dining room was open um, and build a base of customers. So by the time we did open the doors, um, we actually had patio seating open first. And then once the um, dining room furniture finally arrived, we were able to open the doors completely and everything we did was so incremental. And I think that especially our neighbors, we're in Lakeview, by the way, uh, uh, and our neighbors were so accommodating. Um, the uh, 
Chamber of Commerce was really accommodating and, and kind of helping us get the word out as well. So we had sort of a nice little solid base of guests uh, when we fully opened uh, after starting with takeout only. So that was a really nice way of doing things. Um, I'll also say I have a little bit of a leg up because my background is PR and marketing for restaurants, which I did for 12 years before this uh, on my own and with some major boutique mm -hmm. agencies as well. So uh, I had some other ways of sort of getting to know the media in terms of letting them understand what our concept was and, and how we were going to grow into it. Um, and then, yeah, from there, uh, and I agree with Joe on that, you know, once you start getting some of that media coverage, uh, it can make a really big difference in who's making reservations at your restaurant. And for us, we're only 36 seats. So our reservations were getting snapped up really fast. Um, uh, there was a lot of trial and error and learning how to uh, utilize talks capabilities. Um, like one of the things we had started doing was we opened with a three month reservations at a time and we were released that date and everything was snapped up. And some of those regulars who'd been with us from the takeout days were like, we can't get in. What are we supposed to do? And they were frustrated. So we had to sort of pivot and we decided to go to a rolling model. We are still open 90 days rolling, um, but we found that that's really helped in us managing you know what is available and hopefully things don't get snapped up so quickly uh, but there's always you know there's always that chance that you're going to have some major piece of press that you may or may not know is coming out and all of a sudden everything gets booked up so <laughs> um it could be really interesting to it sort of really like balance from, you know, you've got to take a look at both like what you can control and then also be really nimble and agile to make changes when you need to. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's really interesting to me um, which reservations are are good at, at promoting these sort of reservation releases as events and really benefit from doing it at a particular time and, and place and other businesses, you know, work really well with that rolling model. So I, I think the point of listening to your guests obviously is important. Make sure that you're giving them, you know, what makes sense to them. Um, Joe, I did want to jump on something that you said earlier about deposits and, and managing no-shows. Obviously, that's something that we talk quite a bit about here at Talk. Um, so I, I was hoping that you could share a little bit just about, you know, I think most people know, but how no-shows affect the business and, and what you do to try to combat that. Yeah, um, you know, if you're taking reservations at all, it's going to drastically affect what you do from an ordering standpoint, from a staffing standpoint. Uh, and when, you know, uh, every reservation that doesn't show up um, obviously hurts because it's an opportunity cost. You're holding a table for somebody who might not be able to reseat that table in the moment. Um, for us, we've done a good job of, uh, you know, in the beginning, we would purposefully overbook the room because we kind of knew that there was cancellations uh, that were going to happen. And uh, in the off chance that no one canceled, then you're kind of screwed at that point because you have to figure out where to put all those people what that actually did show up. Um, and then there would be nights where it would just be a, a massive amount of cancellations for whatever in the alcohol side at the same time. Um, and you'd be sitting with kind of like a quarter dining room uh, empty. And um, not only is it, uh, you know, harmful to the business, but it's harmful to morale of the staff. You know, they see a room that's not quite as full, um, the servers, that is their livelihood. And so they're kind of, you know, puts them in a different mood, uh, and to help manage that, it is the rate, the main reason we started with talk in the, in the very beginning. And that was to, at, at that time, um, I think, it, like I said, we've been just before the pandemic, maybe 2018, I think we came on, we've tried every other system there is. Um, we went to talk specifically for that deposit. We charge a $10 deposit for every single uh, reservation made. And then that deposit is just applied to their bill. Um, we do, uh, I, I will say, we went from, you know, uh, in the old space, probably 10 to 20 cancellations a night to like 
one a week. Um, and so at first it kind of, it kind of, <laughs> kind of, um, scares the guests because they're, they're so, you know, do I have to, so used to making reservations kind of on a whim. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of communication back and forth in the beginning. Uh, once our, especially our regulars got to know the system, um, it's really, really cut down on everything. It, it, and at first it's scary to kind of get a lot of feedback. What is this? How is this applied? You know, um, but if you can navigate through that and stick with it, um, we have seen uh, an, an absolute, it's the reason we're still here, um, is because we've tried it with other, other reservation systems as well, and they would just charge back on it, and we would lose that charge back all the time. Um, another great thing about TOC is that, you know, they basically, now I'm pretty sure um, they guarantee the charge back, um, so that, and they fight it for you. Uh, and so for us taking all that time uh, to, to go and fight for basically you know, our deposits back, it wasn't really worth our time. Um, so that's been a huge thing that they've been able to help, but it also it sets that expectation uh, up front with the guests, right on our website, it says, hey, this is what's gonna be applied for. When you make the reservation, it tells you what's gonna happen. As long as the guests read everything, which doesn't always <laughs> happen, um, we try to circumvent as much of that um, headache and communication as we possibly can. But it's been a huge help for us, yeah. Excellent, I love that. Yeah, and I do think that you do a, a great job of, really trying to to push the idea that taking care of your staff is is something that's important and that's what the service charge goes towards it's not just you know another another fee um so i agree that that communication is great you did mention that um you were doing a lot of explaining to guests when you first implemented deposits can I ask, you know, did you have conversations internally as a staff or, or were you handling that? Was there someone else who took the lead? Uh, kind of an all hands on deck situation. It's from a host stand. They handle those questions when people come in, um, you know, our general manager or front of service managers, office manager, myself, um, you know, anytime that, again, Four, four years ago, I think this was part, you know, um, less common than it is today as well. And I think the fact that more and more places are, are doing things like this or utilizing these systems, the guests are becoming more and more accustomed to fees or deposits um, on their, their bills. Um, that's a whole other discussion on, on how we can streamline those things because there is a lot of talk and conversation about, about that. But um, it was, it, in the beginning, it was kind of just everybody being able to handle um, having access to a lot of the feedback or the reviews that TAC um, solicits the feedback before they go anywhere else. So we keep that stuff internal. Um, and we addressed a lot of those things, whether they were in person um, or people would call in and ask what this was for. So we had a, a multi-pronged um, attack to be able to handle a lot of that stuff uh, as opposed to just one person kind of um, uh, handling all of it. Got it. That sort of brings me to my next topic, which uh, isn't necessarily a fun one, but responding to guest reviews. I think anyone who's worked in the restaurant industry knows how it feels to receive a negative review. And Lacey, especially considering you have professional marketing background, can you talk to us about how you approach handling negative feedback? Yeah, you know, when I had clients, uh, I would tell them, you know, you can't respond to everyone, you can't take it personally. And sometimes you just have to let it go. Um, being on the other side of the desk now, it's like, okay, well, you know, I'd love to let it go, but some of these really sting. Um, but that said, you can't make everyone happy. So it's just a good reminder that, uh, you know, sometimes people just come in to have a bad time. And we can do everything in our power uh, and we can have the, the highest level of hospitality that we're able to offer uh, and give them an intimate, fun experience. Uh, most of my servers have been here with us from like the beginning. Everyone's been here at least a year. We're now, you know, two and a half years in. So yeah, it's, it, it, people, get to know the servers. I think that's really helped a lot too. But when that negative feedback does come through, um, what is nice with chalk, getting that uh, email to their inboxes right after they've dined, um, it gives them that first opportunity if something's really getting under their skin that they can 
make a comment uh, and have it come directly to us. Uh, and oftentimes we do get the chance then to address it before they jump on Yelp or Google or wherever else yeah. they want to go and, and have their voice be heard. Uh, most of the time, the feedback that we get is just people's opinions. And I have to remind everyone here too, I'm like, it's great. They gave us their opinion and it's not that they're right or wrong. It's just how they enjoyed it. Um, sometimes though, we start to see trends uh, and that is so useful to be able to recognize that, oh, okay, maybe there's something wrong with this dish because now it's come up three times this week in a review um, and just in the internal talk reviews coming through. So let's take a look and go see. Maybe, maybe something's not quite right and it's not performing to our standards. Um, it also gives us an opportunity on the plus side of things, you know, if someone's being called out for like an excellent job um, or a dish is getting a lot of attention that's positive, we get to balance that out with, you know, the more critical feedback and pass that along to the team as well. So we can be like, yes, yeah, so win on that dish. Well done. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's kind of just comes with the territory that sometimes you're going to have negative feedback. And uh, I wish I had better, uh, a better way of saying that, like, you know, don't take it personally. Um, I usually do take it personally. And then everyone's like, Lacey, it's fine. Remember you told us. So it's good. Like we kind of all are in it together uh, with a small team. I think that helps a lot too. So yeah. that's what we do around here. <laughs> How about you, Joe? Yeah, same. I mean, to re reiterate everything, it's like, um, you know, we use that feedback, the, the internal, uh, getting it to them immediately after the reservation, the, the dining experience is fresh in their memory, uh, is really important because, uh, you know, like Lacey says, it's like, they want us just, they need to tell somebody, um, whether it's great or whether it's, whether it's not, I feel like just getting it off their chest before they go to a public forum is very important for us. We do uh, go through every single one. Um, we do not respond to every single one, um, good or bad. However, when there's trends, when there's things uh, that we do see, we, we try to address it. Right now, currently, we have kind of two spaces in our restaurant. One is um, you know, a var far more larger, boisterous section, the back room, which is also a private dining and a production room. It's far more su uh, subdued, reserved. And right now in the restaurant, we're getting a ton of feedback of like, why did you sit me in this back room? Uh, or um, or the opposite of like, we love the fact that we could hear each other and it's a much more like um, a quiet setting. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way to use the system to set the guest that will, to set the guest expectation of where they're gonna sit in the restaurant. That's the next thing we're tackling. And we derive that straightly from the, straight from the feedback that we've gotten from the internal, um, you know, there's a couple on, on Yelp and uh, the Googles, if you want to uh, go look at those, but they they, us they usually are more aggressive when they get to those forums. They try to be more personal when they get to those forums. They try to make it a show. So we try to do everything we can to keep it internal. Um, it's that old kind of adage that if you have a great experience when you're dining out, you're inclined to tell one or two of your friends. If you have a terrible experience dining out, you're gonna tell 10 of your friends never to go eat at that restaurant. So um, everything we can do to kind of get ahead of that um, is really important for us. So for those guests that do leave positive reviews and come back, um, I've always thought that it, it's a slightly different skill from a hospitality perspective, taking care of someone for the first time and introducing them to your concept versus, you know, those regulars that dine with you every week or every month, you have to think of ways to, to keep them engaged. So I'm hoping both of you can maybe share how you think about um, taking care of regulars. Is there anything special you do or, um, not treat them differently, but <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a little bit, like, for, well, from Jump, when you make a reservation, it, there's the option that Talk offers to have some pre-visit questions. So of course we have like the obvious ones in there about, are you celebrating an anniversary or birthday or something else? And please tell us whatever it is. Um, and it, we can also get dietary restrictions or allergies. We can know about those before guests come in. It makes, 
our lives easier if we know that someone is coming in and they're gluten free and they don't do dairy and that includes butter and we use a lot of butter and lots of things have gluten so like if we've got a heads up on that we can start that uh that dining experience with that guest on the same foot so it's not so contentious so they don't feel like they're being put on the spot um, and we can engage them in a useful conversation so that we can give them a great meal and keep them safe um, with our regulars uh, and our repeat guests i mean i think it talk makes it so easy it tells you that somebody's been in once before uh, when they make a new reservation you can see that on their profile uh, so we also really heavily utilize the emojis that are available from talk, um, and not just like this is a family and a friend, uh, but we've made up our own because being labeled as French Canadian, even though like really we're focused on Midwestern ingredients, we get every Canadian who's come to Chicago, they all come here and they tell us and they want to tell us about that. Um, so if we know that we have a Canadian coming in, we have a certain emoji for that. It says, oh, Canada, we all know what it means. We know that we've got to give them a little bit of extra love and listen to them talk about Canada for a minute. <laughs> if chef is free, I'm like, go to table 10 because they want to talk about, you know, Ontario with you. <laughs> um, but we also use it for our, you know, our regulars. We've got different, you know, once you've been in a certain number of times, we probably, we probably already know who you are. Um, we have another category of regular for our neighborhood. Uh, they are a slightly older demographic. They come in a lot and they complain about everything. And even though they have a great time and we love them, but we also want to be prepared. We know when one of our more experienced diners are coming in, we've got a special emoji for that. Um, and we talk about it in pre-shift and we, we figure out who does that person like the best in the restaurant that day? Like a lot of thought goes into it. Um, and you know, it becomes a joke, which is, it's good for morale, um, to be able to sort of joke about these things that could have been really hard about Canadians who are like, that's not how we do it in Canada or, you know, an older diner who comes in and is just going to complain, but we'll also see them in two weeks. Um, that makes things a lot easier. Um, uh, and then on the, the cancellation ends and, uh, no show ends, we definitely made a no show button. And I, I am very active about making sure that if somebody no shows, they get that button and or they get that emoji. And from here on out, I know who you are. I can see if you've made another reservation. We also have, we call them serial cancelers where they, it's better now that we're on the rolling basis, but they uh, would make six reservations over the course of the next three months and show for none. Um, if it gets to that point, I will prevent that person from making new reservations. At this point, it's only a very small handful of people, but it's good to be aware of. Um, the other thing that we did was keep two tables offline. So I have a little bit of wiggle room should we somehow end up overbooked or um, if we know that someone is a serial counselor, I won't move them to that area. I'll keep them in a spot where if they do cancel last minute, then that's gonna go back online on talk and maybe we'll get a new reservation from that. So there's so many different tools and functions that have really helped us in uh, managing the flow of people coming through and understanding our regulars and our guests. Yeah, I love the idea of those those different tags. That's, <laughs> I, I have not heard of some of those before. So <laughs> a great use of the system. How about you, Joe? Yeah, same. All that. It's, um, you know, this, all, we use the feedback, especially the positive feedback quite a bit. Uh, the, you know, the office manager in the morning, their job is to basically come in, review all the notes from the previous night from the reservations, review the feedback. Um, we also have, you know, as part of during service, um, you know, the staff is trained to pick up on certain things. You know, we really love to go above and beyond to make sure we know who's eating in the restaurant at all times. Um, whether we have all that information, the servers are very good at kind of teasing some of that info out. Are they industry individuals? Um, you know, uh, what are their likes, dislikes, allergies at the table? We start that, you know, kind of uh, verbiage, but using the feedback, especially from positive reviews, we will then input that into their profile. So 
If somebody writes back in and said, hey, I had this unbelievable experience with uh, server X, we will put that in their profile, it says likes to sit with this server, or they had a cocktail or a specific dish that they call out, we will say, hey, you know, and over time, as they continually come in, we continue to rack up that information. Um, you know, I feel like this industry has kind of been slow to the whole analytics and the whole data um, and, and going back and, and pouring through that uh, the same way other businesses have been. But as you, when you really start to compile this data and look back over the number of times that they've dined with you, who they've sat with, what they've eaten, you can really start to see patterns. And then we can really tailor it, you know, um, to their experience. Um, whether they work in this industry or not, uh, it, it will change the way that we start with their spiel. Uh, and instead of saying, you know, um, my name is X, Y, or Z, and, and welcome, and this is your first time, it'll just be welcome back. Um, and so just those touches that maybe not everybody picks up on, um, it's kind of the hospitality where we're striving to, to provide. Um, a, a comforting, you know, we're in a neighborhood. The neighborhood is such a big part of what we do. Notice, noticing and picking up on those people who are coming continuously paying our bills for us. It's really important to foster those environments. We know when those individuals, uh, we see them less, that we maybe we need to look at what we're doing, something changed to reach out to these individuals. Um, because when your, neighbor, when your restaurant's full of the neighborhood regulars, then it's, we've seen a really strong um, business, a strong um, sense of community, and just the servers, the staff love seeing the same people. They love seeing the same people when they come in. So all of it, it all factors into just that kind of um, comforting, welcoming, cozy, um, personal experience that we can really help to foster. And we use all of those tricks in the, the emojis, et cetera, um, as well. It's a really great system that uh, kind of uh, is all-encompassing. I totally agree with that too. Like being able to add the notes about like, I mean, we have like, for instance, we just have, we've got this one regular who always sits at the bar and she was coming in with her husband and all of a sudden the husband disappeared. And we were like, hmm, interesting. And she started talking to folks and we found out, you know, she was going through a lot of life changes. So I was like, do not ask about Matt. <laughs> like, hmm. you know, it's just an easy way to keep track of folks. And then, um, you know, we learn their kids' names and their dogs' names. And they're out there on the patio. We can, we greet, the, if you say welcome back and you greet their dog, Murphy, they will love you forever. And it's so simple. It's essentially like what Joe's saying, like customer uh, management relationship tools, CRM kind of things. Like, I don't think the hospitality industry has done a great job of that uh, up until like now we're starting to realize, like we want to be able to utilize information and, and analytics to be able to, uh, make a customer experience even like more accommodating uh, mm -hmm. and technology can really play an important role in being able to organize and manage all of that. Yeah. I worked it with- It costs nothing too. It's like- It costs nothing. The other yeah. part of it. It doesn't cost anything to notice the dog's name's Murphy. And if you put those right. in the notes and somebody's paying attention, like the host will make sure that everybody's given a chit, uh, you know, a printout of every guest that comes in. We know a little bit of background on them. We, you know, our office manager Googles every single reservation to make sure we kind of know who's there. So um, <laughs> that information, you know, for the most part, doesn't really cost anybody any extra money outside of time. For yeah. And especially front of house, I think that that's why most of us got into the restaurant industry is because we like talking to people. We like having conversations. We like taking care of people. So, you know, just let your staff lean in to that a little bit and get to know your guests. I do have a couple of questions that came in from our viewers. They really love this discussion about guest notes and had a few questions about sort of um, how you're mining for information. Joe, I know you mentioned your staff is, is good at sort of asking the right questions at the table, but before the reservation actually occurs, if you have additional questions about allergies or dietary information, how do you handle that? For us, um, for the dietary and things like that, it's it's soliciting like uh, you know they like said when the when the reservation's made, we a pop up uh, pops up. Hey, is there any dietary restrictions? It goes through those kind of steps of questions. Um, when they're sat, you know, um, we make sure that those questions are preemptively asked before the meal starts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and 
it's honestly kind of in that moment. There's there's only so much we can do ahead of time if we, if we don't know exactly who's coming in. Um, like I said, we do Google almost every single reservation name that comes in. We we majority of the time um, there's you know the online footprint that people have is is allows us to see all sorts of things. Um, and so that definitely aids us. You know we can see who's you know vegetarian, et cetera, et cetera. But that's somebody's you know, full time job that we have to kind of make sure that they're going through. Um, that whole get, that guest experience starts before they even get through the door. Um, mm -hmm. And if we can, you know, tailor it a little bit to their experience, uh, you know, the, the, the attention to detail that might not be noticed in real time, um, but it's one of those things where it's just like, man, it's, it's, everything is working and, I'm, you know, um, clicks and it's just one of those. But it, outside of um, soliciting that information, um, for, for allergies specifically, we kind of go directly to the source for the most part. Um, you know, we could probably tell if you're a vegetarian from your Instagram feed though. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but it sounds like you're relatively flexible. I assume for yeah. most dietaries, you Absolutely. can react. Absolutely. How about you, Lexi? Do you do any back and forth before the table? Uh, well, if a guest reaches out uh, on the phone or via email, then by all means, we initiate a conversation with them to get more details and let them know, yes, we can accommodate your restriction or your allergy. Um, thank you for giving us the heads up. And then we put even more detailed notes into their talk profile, um, into the guest portion. So it travels with them when they make other reservations with us. Uh, so that's really super useful. Um, uh, otherwise we do kind of the same, like, well, we're getting that data in the beginning, um, uh, from their pre-reservation questions. And then I'm the one who goes through and, uh, <laughs> Google's names and checks things and adds emojis. Um, so I, you know, if somebody has got, if someone's celiac, I'll put the celiac emoji on them and then we'll sort of take it, we'll take it from there once they arrive to have that conversation with them to get even more details. Is it really celiac? Do you have cross-contamination issues? And once I know that, I then go back and add it again. So if that guest comes back, then we have even more specific information and we can check it with them again on their next visit. But we come out looking like we know so much already. Um, and that really helps people feel even more warmed and welcomed. People are really interested in this process of Googling guests. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask a follow-up question about that. Uh, what information are you looking for or what in particular do you find valuable? I know you mentioned, well, we talked about pets and then dietary restrictions, but anything else that might surprise us? Uh, for, for us, we're looking for, um, you know, honestly, Industry individuals, do they work in the industry? Um, is it is it food or hospitality related? Um, if you do work in the industry and we find out about it, we're going to make sure that we send you a gift. Or um, you know, this industry is not an easy one. We want to make sure everybody who comes in here. Um, we go over and above and beyond for anybody who does work in the industry. Um, the reason for that, outside of just being awesome humans and we want to take care of our own. Um, they have the opportunities to sell our restaurants to anybody that they come in contact with as well. Mm -hmm. um, especially if they're servers from other restaurants, if they are, uh, you know, um, in the front of house, they have direct contact with everybody in their restaurants. And if they're in from out of town um, or they have friends and usually people's friends ask them where they should go eat if they are in the industry. So we try to make sure we're top of mind for anybody who has that experience. So we do go above and beyond for anybody who comes in. Um, majority of it is for that food critics, um, people of note. Uh, you know, we, we kind of want to make sure, um, you know, if somebody, uh, if celebrities or et cetera are actually in your dining room, we have to handle that a different way. It's uh, do you want this? And depending on the celebrity, they want to be anonymous or they want the, you know, the entire dining rooms um, to know that they're there. Um, <laughs> we'll seat them in certain places. We've had both. Um, we we will. Uh, that is the type of information that we're we're most likely looking for, um, you know. But there's also times when we've seen, you know, people are graduating or people are celebrating something special, and we kind of pry that information out of them uh, without giving it away fully, where we can get something or um, or avoid something that they don't like. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with that. We're looking for a couple of big markers in particular, if it's a media person uh, or if it's industry. And it, yeah. we are always so honored when anyone in the industry takes their time off to come and spend it here at our restaurant. So we do the, we are looking for that as well. Um, I will say I do not deep dive every single guest yeah. unless it is a certain time of year, like the National Restaurant Association show when people are coming in or James Beard Award weekend. I am going to look up every single person because if you happen to be nominated for a James Beard Award and we don't know that you come into my restaurant, I'm going to feel really stupid. Uh, so, you know, I sort of take it for when that when you need to look up every single person and the rest of the time when I'm going through and just making sure we have the tags and the emojis on everyone uh, by, you know, I usually look at it by week and then again, each day. Um, I look at our reservations a lot. <laughs> it's probably more than that even, yeah. uh, but uh, I'll look at like things that will set me look, like to think maybe I need to look at this person a little further will be if they've got uh, an email address that sounds like it's a restaurant, um, or if it's a name that I'm recognizing and I don't know why, or uh, if sometimes, especially during those sorts of times of year where it could be anyone from anywhere who might be important, mm -hmm. uh, if they have an out of state area code I've never seen before. <laughs> Um, and then I'll just do a quick search to see if, is this person in the industry? Is this person media? Um, yeah. yeah. And, and that's, you know, usually that's enough. And then retroactively too, if the guest comes in, uh, like we've had a, like, a a Pulitzer prize winning playwright come in and we didn't know because she was the guest of someone else, but now we know who she is. So we have put a note on their reservation, their next reservation that most likely this guy is bringing her in again. Um, so we'll be prepared and we'll send one of our actors over. <laughs> it's also days of the week. Um, we will, spend a lot more time Googling and, and kind of getting that information for Sunday nights and Tuesday nights because they usually are a far more industry heavy crowd on the weekend, or sorry, after the weekend because it's usually their days off. Um, so, you know, as Lacey said, we don't, we don't Google every single, it's impossible to go through every single reservation, hmm. um, but we do, especially in those times, we follow suit exactly the same. It's, it's um, it will, you, next thing you know, you have your dining room on those nights is industry because they know they're going to get taken care of. That's what we want. Um, it helps us advertise ourselves. And similarly, I would say if somebody makes a late night reservation, I'll be like, mm, interesting. It's book <laughs> one at the bar. I wonder who this is. Uh, it's, sometimes yeah. it's a guess. Sometimes you're wrong. You know, if we have single diners coming in, I'm always like, are they from Michelin? <laughs> like, can we? Do we know them? <laughs> have they been here? Um, and so, you know, you just kind of have to be, uh, we're going to treat everyone with the same level of, of hospitality and gratitude for them choosing to dine here. Uh, but if we think that someone might be important, you know, if we know that in advance, we feel like we're more armed and ready for it. Um, although like we're going to deliver the same hospitality no matter what. It's just about curating the experience. I've always heard that people from the restaurant industry eat much faster than regular <laughs> guests. And whenever I dine out with my parents, I, I'm like, yep. <laughs> they're just so I, always, so. I always know when someone comes in and they're like, we want one of everything. And I'm like, I know, I yep. know who you are. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, I have really enjoyed this conversation, but we do have to wrap things up here. Um, for those of you watching, there were a few questions that we didn't get to. So our team will follow up via email with answers. And we will also share the recording of today's webinar. So if you want to share that with your team members, uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you again, Lacey and Joe, for sharing your insights and experience. And thank you, everyone, who took the time to join us today. We hope today's discussion left you inspired to bring some extra hospitality and warmth into your interactions with your guests. If you are not on Talk's platform and would like to learn more about pricing and offerings, please head to exploretalk.com slash join. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks Thank so much. You.
Nej, 